This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Avoid the Maze conversation with Eric Teplitz. And Eric, as you know, I go through your blogs and I find bits and pieces in them. And some of them have been written many, many years ago, it looks like. Uh, they're not all something that yeah. you've just written in the past couple of weeks. Um, and I came across one um, that really hit me. And it was, if at, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And that was the message that I was brought up with. You know, my parents, if I said, oh, I'm a failure, I just can't do it. My father would say, how many times have you tried? And if I say once, he'll say, no, uh, -uh. go back, do it again, maybe change something up. And as a little kid, and I'm saying 12 and under, I'd go to my room crying. You know, my father is horrible. He's making me do this again. And I don't know how to do it. So one of the things I, I'm putting together here is I didn't know how to ask for assistance if I did something wrong. I already felt like a failure. So now if I have mm. to ask for help, I'm a double failure. Um, as an adult, I understand that's not the case. So tell us a little bit about why you wrote this blog, okay? Um, and how we can change the narrative on it because um, I'm just seeing in today's youth, they figure if they make a mistake, they're done, they quit, they go on to something else. Okay, so first let me talk about the context in which that post was written. So okay, sure. the post was a little a little bit of a play on words because you'll notice that in the title, uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Right. The word try is spelled T-R-I instead of T-R-Y. So this right. was written in the context of my attempting my third attempt to complete an Ironman triathlon, which was just a crazy goal that I uh, eventually set for myself completely unexpectedly, I might add. I was not, I, I was not a particularly athletic kid and I'd never really had uh, aspirations of that nature. Uh, and what I found was that kind of to my surprise as an adult, I think in part as a result of having moved to Los Angeles. Uh, in Los Angeles, first of all, we have year round pretty incredible weather and it, and it lends itself to being outside a lot. So people are frequently outside and exercising and, and there's a certain health and fitness consciousness here as well. This is in kind of sharp contrast to where I grew up on the opposite coast in Philadelphia, Philadelphia is known for, you know, kind of being um, a haven for the world's unhealthiest foods and, and, <laughs> and kind of takes pride in it almost. And, you know, it's not, I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of fit and, and athletic people that populate Philadelphia, but my, you know, that, that was, a, it was a different context for me. And, and I, slowly, very gradually and unexpectedly got sucked into this um, world of endurance races. And honestly, no one was more surprised about it than I was. And it was a progression. It, it was sort of like I, I started with, a, with what you might consider a gateway drug, which was just simply, I bought a mountain bike and started riding my bike to the beach from where I lived and really loved it. And then it just progressed from there with exploring, huh, I wonder maybe I could try, you know. And before I knew it, uh, within a matter of some years, uh, and believe me, like I said, I, when, even when I think about it now, I, I can't imagine it. An Ironman triathlon is, first of all, a triathlon is a race that consists of three parts, a swim portion, a bike ride, and a run, okay? And there are triathlons of different distances. So they have shorter distance ones, which is what I started with. And the, the sort of, uh, well, I don't know if it's the ultimate anymore, but the ultimate you know, at one point in time was what was called the Ironman triathlon. Right. And it is, uh, it's a pretty grueling and, uh, you know, extremely challenging race that's taken that you essentially you have to complete within a day, usually within 17 hours. 
and and the distances are a 2.4 mile by excuse me a 2.4 mile swim usually in open water followed by a 112 mile bike ride all right wow. and then after that not not kidding after that you run a marathon a full 26.2 mile marathon and you know to any sort of um quote normal unquote person it sounds utterly mad utterly ridiculous you got to be kidding why would anyone in their right mind volunteer for such a thing to do such a thing <laughs> um so uh, but it's a very curious thing that once you step into this world of uh races and endurance sports even modestly it becomes sort of i think positively addicting because it feels great to feel great. You know, you when you exercise uh, on a regular basis, it really makes a huge difference in your, your health and your mood and, and your outlook and everything. And also being someone that's always been interested in human potential and curious about my own, exploring my own, it is, it's a quite, it's quite an experience to uh, take something that for you, whatever that happens to be, even if it's a 5K, you know, um, which is a 3.1 mile running race, a 5K race. For some people, doing such a thing is a radical uh, transformation, and and they have programs known as Couch to 5K right. that, that give you a you know a program to train you from being like totally sedentary uh, to um, actually completing a 5K race. And for some people, that's that's truly a, a game changer. Sure. Because, because not only are you, you know, you're, you're taking something that might appear to you not possible or not possible for you. And then you've done it. And once you've had an experience like that, you know, it's, you, it just naturally makes you wonder, huh, I wonder what else I could do. And especially if it was an enjoyable journey, not just sure. the race, but, right. but if it was, if you enjoyed the whole experience of having yourself, you know, uh, the experience of both physically and mentally adapting and, uh, stretching yourself to reach a goal. It's, it's pretty incredible. So I know this is a long winded answer, but I feel like it needs context, you know? So I wrote that post um, when I was, I had, I had actually progressed over the course of years, I had done a short distance triathlon and then I, I did a marathon, which was a, for me, an insane, un, like I never, ever would have expected that I would even consider doing that to me. It just seemed like pure masochism and punishment, but I got <laughs> intrigued and I trained for it. And I had a, a truly amazing experience again, not just with the race, the race was incredible, but the whole journey of progressing through and watching myself, watching myself change and, and, and get stronger and rise to the challenge and learn mental tricks and techniques for persevering. And also, you know, riding that balance of pushing yourself, but not too hard, but like finding that sweet spot of pushing yourself and also making sure to relax and rest in between so that your body can catch up and internalize those gains that you've made. The whole thing was just, it was just an incredible experience. And eventually it progressed again, no one was more surprised than I to attempting a full-blown Ironman triathlon, which to me, my goal was simply just to finish the thing, just to be able to complete those distances right. before the, they said you can, no, you must stop because there are cutoff times. Um, and I wrote a post early on in my blogging called the most athletic day of my life, which was a play by play account of the first, my first attempt at an Ironman. And it's kind of like the first Rocky movie. He doesn't win the big fight at the end, but he has so much heart. And he's given so much of himself and he's gone undergone this radical transformation. Right. And he's, he's, he's one love ultimately. Um, and in a sense, like, and at the time that was the most athletic day of my life. That first Ironman attempt, it might even to this day still have been uh, because I, I far surpassed anything I had ever 
done up to sure. that point. And even though I didn't quite make it, it's a harrowing tale. I recommend it. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, but anyway, so it took, it was three years after that, that I made my second attempt to complete an Ironman. And I, I chose a race unknowingly, unwittingly that it, that was probably the hardest course in North America. Um, now, not that there's such a thing as an easy Ironman course, but there are, some courses are more challenging than others for, you know, like in terms of the conditions, the elevation that you're, that you're at, the, uh, the amount of elevation changes and gain like hills. And, and this course, the second, my second attempt was, uh, my first attempt was Ironman Arizona, which was in Tempe. Second one was a race that no longer, they no longer do it as a full Ironman distance race, which was in St. George. Utah. So I actually knew going in at some point, I realized, oh, this, like, I am not going to finish this. Like the odds are no matter how hard I train, this is probably just not realistic because it's, I'm the back of the packer. I'm like, just trying to finish. And, and this, like, this is a race that had, it was a new race it was only the second year they were running it. And the first year, like the dropout rate was insane. And it was just, you know, it's just like, I was, terrified when I realized, but I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll try it anyway. I'll do it. I'll do my best. But as a backup, I signed up for another race that was a few months later, which was called Vine Man also, which now no longer exists in Sonoma County, California. And so I, I figured, okay, like worst case scenario, I'll have a vacation in Utah. I'll get a good, you know, training day in. And so it was my third attempt in Sonoma County um, in 2011, um, that I actually, you know, I, you know, they say third time's a charm. And for me, it actually was, I, I did complete the race. I did finish, um, the whole thing. And, um, so the title was sort of a tongue in cheek, um, you know, version of the expression. Right. If at first you don't you try, try again. Um, now, you know, to, to talk about that subject more broadly, I think, you know, you bring up an interesting point, which is that, if you we're really talking about failure and we're really talking about the internalization of failure and what and the meaning that we assign to failure. So uh, if you go for something and you know it it doesn't work out, and that could be due to a rejection by another person or or institution, it could be, you know, not reaching your goal. I mean, it could be, you know, you people so have things. all different, yeah, all different like sort of uh, assessments of what constitutes success and failure. Right. And that alone is an interesting lesson because the mindset that you have going into something and the expectation that you have is massively huge. I want to, I really want to emphasize this point. Um, when I was training for my first marathon, I bought a book called it was called the uh, non-runners guy what was it called something like the non the non-runners marathon trainer something along those lines i might be getting it slightly off um and the gist of the book was it was intended for people who had never done this before who maybe weren't even really very experienced with running and the book i know this is long-winded again but trust me you, you'll see why i'm, okay. I'm mentioning it <laughs> Uh, there, the book had three authors. It was written by three people. Two of them were professors at a college in the Midwest, and one of them was one of their students. These two professors taught a marathon training course at their college. One professor was like a phys ed professor, and the other was a psychology professor. So one approached marathon training from the with the from you know from, from the physical training perspective, what you need to do in order to um, you know condition your body physically to be able to do a marathon. Just as important, if not more so, was the psychology professor's angle on it, which which involves the mental aspects of training, which I can't tell you are absolutely fascinating, and I think that you ultimately come up with your own sort of tricks and techniques and things that you learn through your own experience that help you push through the difficulties that you're experiencing. Uh, that is obviously very fascinating. And the third author was one of their students who wasn't necessarily particularly physically fit. And 
just wanted to have this experience and she did it. And their course had a, so she gives her perspective of going through the program. Okay. So you get these three different perspectives and, uh, you know, their course had something like a 99% success rate of kids that signed up for their course, actually completing a marathon. Pretty, pretty impressive. Wow. Yeah. And, and so here's the point that I want to make. And, and this is about the, the, how we define success and failure in advance, even before we've even made an effort. Somewhere toward the beginning of the book, uh, they present this idea that, that they really want to drive home. Look, your goal in this whole endeavor is to finish a marathon, right? And, and when you're starting off, that might seem incredibly intimidating, incredibly daunting, and also incredibly exciting. And so at the beginning, you're most likely like, if you've picked up this book and read the first chapter like I did, and I was totally excited and I thought, I believed, like I thought, wow, I'll do it. <laughs> and I went home, I bought the book. It was at a, back in the olden days of, of uh, you know, I bought a Barnes books. and Noble store. And, yep. I, and I went home and signed up right then and there, committed myself, to, I signed up for the LA Marathon and, and, you know, like firmed up my commitment to really doing this and, and seeing the program through. And so at the, you know, they, they, they emphasize maybe at even different points in the book, they say, remember your goal. Your goal is to follow this step-by-step step and finish a marathon. And what they, what they say is don't change the goal midway through. Don't move the goalpost. And what they mean is it's, it's very easy to, once you've, you know, to say, like, let's say you're far into the training and you're like, oh, you know what? I could probably finish this thing in and, you know, in a certain amount of time, like based on like, ah, you know, and, and they say, don't do it. Don't change the goal. If you want to do another marathon after this one and have it like have a time goal, for instance, great. That's fine. For this, your goal is to finish the marathon. Why? Because you can, let's say you, you, you know, you decide to train for this marathon, you, you're, you're using their program, you're following their program, and then you say, you know what? No, I want to finish a marathon in under four hours or whatever, pick your time, right? So let's say you then do the race and you don't, you don't meet the goal. You can potentially take something that may have been for you one of your most significant and empowering and positive experiences and accomplishments. It's possible just through the power of that gray matter in your head to take something like that and turn it into a failure experience. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because you, you know, because you changed the goal and it was, you know, it, it, and I think that that is a huge lesson, a huge lesson. So I'm not saying don't aim for big goals. I love big goals, but I think, and, and I'm, I'm speaking from experience here, we don't give ourselves enough credit for what are to us personally big wins. We instead look at uh, how it looks externally and compare ourselves to what other people might be doing and what other people might even be thinking of what we're doing. Right. Might, might. And so only you know what is a big deal to you and what is a, a, an accomplishment to you. And so what am I trying to say? So if you're, if you're putting yourself out there in some fashion, you're going for something that's hard for you based on the point at which you are in your stage of your life's journey, you're being bold, you're taking on something that's difficult, Okay. And that's very contextual, different for everyone, different for everyone at different times of their lives. I think it's hugely important to acknowledge yourself, A, just for the attempt, just for summoning up the courage to go for it and risk potential rejection, potential failure, potentially not getting there. Um, that alone you've already, is already a win. You've already won and really take that in. And, you know, if necessary, divide up the journey 
It's not just I succeeded or I failed. No. If you're training for a marathon, each time, each day that you show up for a training run and complete that run, that's a win. That's a win. Really acknowledge yourself, you know? Now, anything can happen. And it's very possible. Part of the appeal, I think, of doing these um, endurance races for me was I felt like it helped me build a stronger internal lo locus of control. And what that means is, you know, it's a popular sort of psychological term of locus of control, which means that, you know, some people feel like um, whether or not they succeed is completely dependent upon the outside world and other people and other things. And that, that, that means you have an external locus of control. And for people who have an internal locus of control, they believe that they are responsible for whether or not they succeed. One is not necessarily more accurate than the other, but it's a mindset and perspective. And obviously, as you can imagine, it's more empowering to have a stronger internal locus of control. Now, there's always, always things out of our control that can sabotage us, that can wreck our plans, that can derail us, and that can prevent us from reaching our goal, no matter how steadfast and, and you know, um, determined we may be. And so things do happen. And I know people who have, i um, thinking of one person in particular, who um, really wanted to complete a marathon, and she had done a number of half marathons, and was, you know, like a ran every day, and was into it and loved it and really wanted to complete a marathon. And she tried I don't remember how many times it was, but what would happen is at a certain point in her training, at a certain distance, at some point beyond the 13.1 miles that constitutes a half marathon, somewhere in her training, 14, 16 miles, whatever the run was, she would injure herself. And it would, you know, she, it would be such a disappointment because this happened numerous times. Like she really wanted to do it. And for whatever reason, either her body was saying, uh uh, nope, not doing it or what, you know, whatever. And I think she eventually made peace with it. I don't think she, you know, um, I don't think she ever finished a full marathon, but she, you know, she came to the realization, look, I, I did my part. I showed up, I keep trying and maybe it's just not in the cards for me for whatever reason. Now, I think one of the hardest things in life is this discerning when effort is what's called for and when acceptance is what's called for. So with this idea of if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Um, it, from one perspective, it's a very healthy attitude to have. And I think it might strike younger people today as maybe a bit old fashioned and maybe even a bit, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. What's the big yeah. deal? Try, like, it, it, can, it might even sound harsh. But it shouldn't. I think the spirit of it is don't give up on yourself right away. Um, understand that, fa quote, failure, quote, unquote, failure is success. And what I mean by that, I know that sounds like Orwellian. <laughs> so, uh, what I mean by that is that if you're not failing at things in life, you're then maybe, maybe anything. you're really... Yeah, you're not like, you're not doing yourself justice. Like you're not really putting yourself out there and making an effort because failure is part of the process of success. I would vent, I don't, you know, I don't know everything about everything. <laughs> I'll be the first to say that. I mean, not by a long shot, but I would suspect that anyone that has succeeded at something that is like, you know, that, that we at large look at and, and with a sort of a wow reaction, right? Like anyone that's achieved any kind of significant thing in their lives and throughout history that we would, you know, sort of uh, uh, collectively call a success inevitably experienced a ton of failure along the way. It's the nature of it. And so adjusting your mindset, and this is, this is hard, by the way. <laughs> um, I had to learn this the hard way for sure, but the attitude that you bring to an endeavor and an enterprise and even a goal from the beginning is massively important 
And because a success or if like, basically you could say, there's no such thing as success or failure. There's just results. There's just empirical facts. Success and failure in a large sense is a perception. So two people can have the same experience and one can look at it as a huge success and the other can look at it as a huge failure all by the story that they tell themselves about what happened. Right, exactly. Well, you know, when you were talking about from uh, couch to 5K uh, in 2018, um, I had a gentleman on who was doing a running show with us and I was getting more and more excited every week. It's like, you know, what can I do? What can I do? And he discussed couch to 5K and I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. I've never been a runner. In (laughs) fact, I don't like running. Um, <laughs> Neither did I. I hated it <laughs> I have, uh, initially. I have a metal bar in my left leg, so I wasn't mm. sure how that if that would affect me or not. And he convinced me, you know, do the program because in the beginning you're going to walk. You're not yep. going to run. You got to get those feet on the ground. And I did everything. I was getting ready. I started. I think it was July of 2018. And the run I had planned was for April of 2019. So, and I was told you have more than enough time because I knew I wasn't going to be outside in the ice and snow. Hmm. Two weeks before the race, I started noticing something very strange with my right knee. Hmm. And even walking was painful. And I thought, well, I better go get this check because I've got this race coming up and I've been preparing and I'm ready. And I go to the doctor and he looks at me, he goes, uh, your kneecap is the worst kneecap I've ever seen. Ooh. It is bone upon bone, but I can't do anything yet because you're too bruised. So hmm. you need to basically stay off that leg for a good six months. Mm. And I sat in his office and I didn't even realize I was crying, but tears are just streaming down my face. He said, Karen, it's not that bad. Really, really. I do. You know, <laughs> he replaced me all the time. And I said, you know, you don't understand. I wanted to do this 5k. And I told him how I've been working out. And he goes, you know, people can't come see a doctor before they start preparing because you'd have too many people in line saying, can you check out my knee? Can you check out my hip? He said, I think you've had this problem for a while, but everything you did to train made it worse. Hmm. So I said to him, once I have the surgery, how long before I can run? He said, you're going to have to give yourself a good year. So I'm looking Hmm. at this timeline and It was like, that's not fair. Hmm. But yet something triggered me. And I said, maybe I'll never run it, but I can walk it. Mm -hmm. And so after my knee surgery, which was at the beginning of the pandemic, um, Hmm. for exercise, my husband and I went out walking every single morning. But then every afternoon, I'd go out on my own. Mm -hmm. And I just kept achieving and achieving. And I had a buddy who would, I would call before I started walking. He would put on his timer. I put on my timer. (laughs) So if I called and said, Uh, so this was like during the pan, like this is like, like, right. Yeah. Well, we were sort of in lockdown. Yeah. yeah. So you're doing your your remote, your remote, your remote accountability partners and running buddies. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's awesome. I finally got up to walking five miles oh, and I thought, well, fantastic. it's better for me than running. Was it 3.5? 3.1. Oh, 3.1. So my, yeah. my knee wasn't hurting. I was getting it stronger. Um, I knew that. And I was also told if I really ran too much, the bar in my leg, which was never put in properly. Anyways, um, they would probably have to take out and I don't want to have that surgery. And so I chose my own success. 
And that's what I hope people will start to do that. You know, I can dream about doing the Ironman, (laughs) but I really don't swim real well. So (laughs) that's their taking (laughs) swimming lessons. That stops a lot of people, believe me. And there's a lot of different things that, you know, I could look at and say, I would love to do it. And I can make excuses for not doing it, but we have to be realistic. And I think that's what you're talking about that. If it's something you want to do and you physically can train for it, go for it. I think we set ourselves up to be failures and we try to do something that just we're not getting the a lot proper of training for a lot of it, as I said, is the mentality you bring to it, by the way, congratulations and awesome. And what, what your story to me exemplifies is maturity and wisdom. You did not let the disappointment of the physical reality of your body. You didn't let it defeat you. Instead, you pivoted and said, what can I do? And you, and honestly, truth be told, walking is on the whole, probably a lot healthier for us long-term than running. People are very different physiologically, and some people are able to sustain um, the pounding on pavement into their seventies and even beyond. And it's incredible and bless them. But, you know, the, the, especially running on pavement is very, very, um, impactful to our joints and to our knees and to our, I mean, muscle, like it really is a lot harder on us than walking. Walking might be the healthiest thing like to do. (laughs) Um, And so, and and this is, you know, ego of course is a, is a factor in this, like, ah, like, you know, but so I applaud you for pivoting and still giving yourself this. First of all, you improved your fitness right? and you, you gave yourself all of these positive experiences and you gave yourself a huge success in, you walked the 5k. Is that what you did? No, I didn't go to the 5k. Did you end up doing, or, I, but oh, I did. But I basically, walked, I was so. You surpassed that distance. Right. You, you walked it, more than that. Yeah. And the interesting part is I signed up for another one, but when I said I was going to walk it, mm-hmm. they said, uh, you're going to be interfering on, on the They track. wouldn't allow it. And yeah, I said, okay. okay, you know, I got that. But then they, they hooked me up with this buddy and said, but you could do this. This is what a lot of people do that, you know, can't participate in the 5k. And I said, yeah, but my husband won't be at the finish line. I mean, that was something that I wanted. Mm-hmm. And they said, what's more important, doing it for yourself or doing it for your husband. And my husband could have cared less if I did it or not. <laughs> I mean, he was applauding me for doing it, but it was sure. like, you know, hey, go ahead, do it. And I thought, you know what? Even if he was at the finish line, I know my husband's enthusiasm would have been, okay, you're hot and sweaty. I'll see you in a little while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and also, you know, there are different, you know, another possibility was you could have found a different, they have so many of these races yeah, and events yeah. and some of them might be more um, accommodating to walkers than others. So that's another thing, but yeah, I mean, the ultimately is like the this point I take from your story is what's, what's the most, why are you doing this and what's most important to you? Right. And so, um, you know, the way the healthiest attitude that I think to try to cultivate and it's taken me, I'm going to be 50 years old real soon. It's taken me pretty much my whole life to get to this point, to be able to sum it up. I don't know if I shared this with you before or not, to be able to sum it up in three words. I finally distilled what I've been learning my whole life into three words. You ready? Ready. This is, I know it's a, it's a big setup, so it might disappoint. (laughs) Here it is. Here's the mantra. Explorations over expectations. To me, that is really, really internalizing that and really getting it and really living it. It's not easy, no. but it's, it's the path to growth. It's the path to happiness. It's the path to peace. It's, it's, it's it. It's the answer. Like, in other words, to approach things 
instead of with this, I must, you know, having this like huge expectation, which, you know, you're, 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 what you're doing, if you have a huge expectation for something is you're essentially making yourself extremely vulnerable to, to massive disappointment. Like oh, you're doing that. You're doing that. Right. If you take the same goal or curiosity or interest that you have, you approach it as an exploration and you say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to go for it. I'm going to, I'm going to have an experience. I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to maybe put, make myself a little uncomfortable. And hopefully what you're going to do is you're going to make yourself proud. How? By summoning up courage, by acting in the face of fear, despite your fear, by learning, by growing, by doing things, the things that are in your control to do to reach for something that you want. Now, ultimately, and I think I was raised in a certain sense, I think we have maybe a cultural belief. If you dream it, it can be, <laughs> you know, we, we, we have these messages growing up. Like if you just want something badly enough, you know, if you just try hard enough, your dreams will all come true. It's bullshit. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> it's bullshit, bullshit and it's harmful because it's, I mean, maybe, maybe the only way to find out is to, to try, but I think that by internalizing that message, um, we're doing ourselves harm, actually, and the healthier, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at this. Uh, I've, I've really, I've learned really the hard way, believe me, over, you know, I've written a lot about this. Um, And, and I still struggle with it, like, you know, because it's, we're human, you know, we're human. Um, But I have found that when I approach things from the perspective of exploring it, rather than having like my well-being and happiness and sense of self-worth attached to a particular result coming from it, that's to me, that, that, that is, man, that is self-destructive. It really is. Uh, I'll give you some examples. I'll give you one example in particular. So, because I think this was a, a you know, this, this one um, meant, this one meant something to me. Um, one of the many, you know, I, I get, I get interested in things. And when I do, I kind of, I can really like get obsessed with them and just kind of go all in. <laughs> um, and, and it sometimes surprises me what those things end up being. They like the whole Iron Man thing, and even just the whole triathlon thing and, and every step along the way of that journey um, was a, would have come as a complete surprise to a younger version of me. In fact, if you were to tell a younger version of me that I was going to do any of all those things, I would say, yeah, you got the wrong guy. Like not me. Like that <laughs> right. doesn't even interest me. I have no, it just sounds like torture to me. I would have no interest. So, um, so, you know, life can, can surprise you and you can also surprise yourself. And sometimes you become interested in something that, you know, you, you weren't ready to be interested in until then. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, you know, I found a lot of solace and um, to this day still do in hiking and being out in nature and, and not just exercising, but going for walks out in nature. And to me, this is like the most just restorative nourishing uh, for my mind, body and soul. Like it's just something that really feeds me and really uh, is, I don't understand it completely and I don't need to, it, I just know like, this is how I take care of myself. And this is just so good for me. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, again, I, I know I'm long winded, so I'll, tr- I'll try to truncate the story. But basically, I was doing a lot of hiking. And a guy that I met, I started doing hiking with a, with a group instead of just going out on my own back on the East Coast. And a guy that I befriended from doing a bunch of these hikes, he, he, he invited me at one point. He said, you know, I'm leaving a backpacking trip uh, in, uh, in a, whenever it was, in a few weeks from now. Um, and it's a three-day, two-night, you know, backpacking trip. Uh, do you want to come? And I was like, well, I was a total city kid. I was 27 years old at this point. And as much as I loved long day hikes, and I was a pretty good strong hiker, 
I had literally never even spent a night outside camping in a tent ever. Like this was not something yeah. that was part of my upbringing. <laughs> I, you know, and um, so I, I said, it sounds intriguing. It sounds kind of fun and great, but, and then I gave him like a litany of excuses. I've never done this. I've never even camped. I don't have any gear. I don't know how to use any, you know, and one by one, he's like, oh, no problem. He's like, I've got all kinds of extra stuff. I could loan it to you. I can loan you a backpack. I can loan you a tent. Um, we're going to share, we're going to use a cooking stove and share it. So, you know, I'll help you set up. It's like he basically every objection or, or excuse that I could come up with, he, he like easily just refuted. Yeah. And so I was like, uh, uh, oh, okay. I guess I'll do it. <laughs> and, and it was a, he, it was a life changing experience for me, really life changing. Um, I was pretty scared. I was, ang- I had a lot of anxiety as I, I put on this huge backpack, massive. I'd never done this before. And I, we left the parking lot and we're going to be away. We were going to go out into the woods for the whole weekend. And we started by climbing this very steep hill. And I had this massive backpack on my back. And I had this moment of panic, like, uh, I don't know if I want to do this. Should I be doing this? Like, uh, I don't know if I can do this. And I, and, but it just really lasted a moment. I'm like, look, you're here. You're not going to, you're not going to back out of this. Just go and enjoy yourself. And I loved it. I loved it. And it, it really was a life-changing experience in so many ways. And it put me on a new path and I had now a whole new interest to explore. And it was only so about a year after that, I was now living in California and um, I was reading a book by Bill Bryson called A Walk in the Woods. And this book is uh, about Bill Bryson's wonderful. And the book is about his attempt. He had been, he was, he was American. He had lived abroad for a long time and he wanted to sort of reintroduce himself to his home country by hiking the Appalachian Trail. Oh, wow. Which is a yeah, it's a yeah. it's a roughly at the time of the mileage changes as they reroute it and and you know uh, reconfigure it. But basically, it's a two thousand one hundred and sixty eight mile long hiking trail, continuous trail that goes through fourteen U S states, starting from Georgia in the south all the way up to Maine in the north. Right. Uh, and so he decides to go on this adventure, and the book is hilarious, and and it it's a brilliant, wonderful book. And I think that if you ever read this book, you probably are going to have one of two reactions to it. One being, yeah, I would never in a million years ever even consider doing something like that. It's nuts. Or you go, I kind of have to do that. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds amazing. And so I obviously had the latter reaction. And I told myself, this was the summer of 2001. I read this book and I told myself, most people that are attempting to through hike the trail to do the whole thing, generally on average takes people about six months. And um, they, they usually start around late March or early April seasonally to make it logistically possible to hike from south to north based on weather and, right. and such. And, um, and so I told myself, I kind of mentally said, look, I, I'm perfectly willing, because I was new to LA at the time. I, I, I told myself, if I, um, if I don't have a compelling reason to stay in LA come that time of year, next year. And I, I was more than willing to, I'm like, please like let, let there be many compelling reasons, but if there aren't any, I'm on that trail in the spring, I'm doing it. Just sort of like told myself that. And what happened was early, early the following year, um, it was a really interesting progression of events where I met this woman that I was really interested in and really hopeful that that we were going to have this great connection And also I had a job possibility come my way that I was really excited about. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing (laughs) if both of these things work out? Because I was 29. Is that right? Yeah, 29 years old. Wouldn't it be amazing if by the time I reach my 30th birthday, I basically like get all my shit together and I have like I find this wonderful relationship, this wonderful woman, and I have a job that I really love and I'm living in LA and wouldn't that be great? Well, as you could probably guess, it all fell apart. The the (laughs) woman totally was just not, it was not a mutual thing. She just was not interested in that. You know, it was sort of more, you know, interested in being a friend and that was that. Um, and, um, And the job completely fell through. And I was bummed, man. I was like, 
I was really disappointed. And I've just felt like, well, now what? Now what the hell do I do? And in the back of my mind, like I hadn't really thought about it much, I think, at that, for a while. It was like, ding, you can go and hike the Appalachian Trail. You can do this. You have nothing stopping you. You can do it. And literally with three weeks of preparation, three weeks, in three weeks time, I got all of my stuff, like I put my stuff in storage, I, I was renting a, a bedroom in an apartment on a month to month basis, like I took a care of all the details, got all the gear that I needed, bought a one way plane ticket to Atlanta, Georgia to where, you know, to get to the southern terminus of the trail, did everything. And sure enough, uh, got myself on the trail. Now, it's a long story, and I'm not even done yet, but here's the reason I'm telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm telling the story is explorations over expectations. So when I w- embarked on this adventure, and it was so exciting, I still really didn't have very much backpacking experience. I was very much a beginner. I would had some experiences for, a w- for weekend trips and that was a, and not, you know, I was not at all a seasoned backpacker or experienced, but I really didn't know the ins and outs of it. I just knew that I loved it. And I thought, I have no, I literally no idea how far I'm going to make it. Like, yeah, I would love to hike the whole thing. Like that's kind of the goal, right? Like to see, right. like, wouldn't it be cool to hike from Georgia to Maine and, and have this unbelievable, like, you know, uh, adventure. But, but, but honestly, like if you read Bill Bryson's book, you learn that people who, and I had, did this on three weeks notice, there are people that plan this out a year in advance. They prepare packages to have shipped to them at various points. Like they really uh, like logistically. Okay. Care. I was more or less winging it. I, I, I thought I'll just get, you know, there are places you can stop along the way to resupply with food and fuel for your stove and that kind of thing. And I thought, I'm just going to like, you know, kind of see how it goes. And, but the truth is that people who actually make plans to do the whole thing, an an alarming percentage of of them drop out only 30 miles in at this one point called Neil's gap, where they, the reality of it hits them and they're like, yeah, I'm not doing this. And so like that happens. So I was approaching this with a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of interest and obsessive interest and, you know, and, 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 and just, you know, a lot of joy and a lot of excitement, but I also had no idea how far I would get. Would I drop out after 30 miles? Would I last a week? Would I last two weeks? Would I last a month? Would I make do the whole thing? No, I, how could I know? I don't even have much experience doing this, but I was going to find out. It was a term. I was like, you know what? I'm going to have an adventure and I approached it. I didn't use this language at the time, but I'm going to explore this. I'm going to have an exploration. I'm going to give myself this amazing gift of this amazing adventure that I'm able to, to do at this time of my life. I have the physical health. I don't have any responsibilities that are going to prevent me from doing this. You know, I got catastrophic health insurance in case something happened, high deductible health insurance. I took care of everything. I had money saved up from a crappy job I hated that I worked at the, for the prior year. And, um, and I went and it was this open-ended thing. Like I gave myself enough, I gave myself the possibility of finishing the whole thing. Like, I'm like, I bought a one-way ticket and I'm, I don't have anything on my calendar for the next six months. So let's go and see. But I wasn't attached to it. And, um, so just showing up with a fully loaded backpack at the start of the trail, it's like, look at this ding, ding, ding success a win. I'm here. Exactly. I did it. I did it. I got myself here. And I'll just wrap this up kind of with an amusing anecdote, which is I remember my feeling of empowerment of when I got on the trail and I was there and I'm ready to start and I have all my gear with me and I'm all, you know, and I remember feeling the feeling I had was I'm free. Look at this. I am the master of my life. I decided I wanted to do this. I'm here. And now I call the shots. If during the course of a day, if I want to walk, I walk. If I want to rest, I rest. If I want to eat, I eat. If I want to sleep, I sleep. My life is very simple, Um, but I'm free. I am now, you know, and then what happened was I ended up 
lasting, I'm sure you're curious, I ended up doing about a quarter of the trail, which was roughly about 540 miles. Wow. Okay. And I spent about, I spent about eight weeks on the trail total. And at that point, I was really miserable. I was like, this is not fun anymore. Uh, it was summertime. It was really, really hot. I had my allergies were kicking in. I was exhausted. I wasn't having fun. And I reached, I, I had hitchhiked to uh, Shenandoah National Park. So I'd skipped a large portion of the trail because I wanted to see Shenandoah since so I'd never been there. And there are a lot of street crossings at that part of the trail. And I would just pray, like, please let me find someone that will rescue me and take me back to town because I really, I kind of don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and, and I, I found a couple that were, had been camped, you know, had been spending the weekend out there and were packing up and getting ready to go back to town, which was Charlottesville was the closest town. And I just had these puppy dog eyes and like started talk with them. And I'm like, will you take me with you? <laughs> and they're like, sure, come on it, you know, hop on. And I'm like, I'm free. Yeah. <laughs> I'm free. So I came full circle, you know, and the, the point of it is, is I didn't finish the whole trail. And yet it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. One of the greatest adventures of my life. And a lot of it had to do with the mindset and the attitude that I brought to it and the way that I defined success for myself. So. And, you know, just hearing those words, exp ex exploration rather than expectation. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's not exactly the same, but my husband and I are not good vacation takers. You know, we always talk about things that we want to do and either work or something else gets in the way. And um, about four years ago, he said to me, you're taking off work for four days and I'm taking you somewhere. And I kept saying, well, where? And don't worry about it. Um, we'll have fun. And I kept thinking his idea of fun is sitting and watching old TV shows. Okay. Um, why are we going anywhere? But anyways, we get in the <laughs> car and we're driving to um, Southeast Southeast in Ohio. And he's taking this back road. Where are we going? And he said, we're going to Marion. I said, what's in Marion? Oh, lots of things. So he had looked it up and it looked like there were all these wonderful sites. So we get to Marion, Ohio, which looks like any other little city in Ohio. And the hotel that we were going to stay at, you know, was decent. He knows that, you know, Karen doesn't like anything that might have bugs in it. Um, and so we drop off our luggage. Then don't, don't stay on the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we go to the first stop, which is supposed to be the telephone museum. We get out, we walk up to the door. There's a sign on it. Must call a week in advance if you want to go through museum. I looked at him and I said, didn't you check this out? Honey, don't worry. Well, it, it was like that, that whole day, no matter where we went. And the irony, I, of course, of the telephone museum and you have to call in advance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I had these expectations the way he mm. was going to plan this. But by dinner time that night, I just said to him, I'm always going to remember this vacation. And I could remember every place that we stopped at and had a little story behind it. Uh -huh. And I looked at him and I said, I really don't want to come back here, but this is probably the best vacation uh -huh. I've ever taken because we laughed. We were exploring. Mm -hmm. um, and so now it becomes a joke. If we're starting to go south to down Ohio, he'll say to me, if we go west, you know where we can go. And it's like, Yes, so we're not going to go there anymore. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, the spirit again, like the spirit that you bring to something and the way you, the story you choose to tell about it and the way you choose to look at it. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, this was another great conversation. I appreciate it. Um, I'll look through your blogs. We'll come up with another one for next month. Awesome. Always a pleasure, Karen. Thanks for listening. Thanks. I know I get long-winded on no, those stories. No, I love it. <laughs> love your stories. Have a great day. You too. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.